is a really cool space. Whoa! Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Mark Isaacson. I'm a senior at the college. I'm the president of the Harvard Republican Club, and this semester I've had the privilege of serving as a liaison for Margaret Spellings. Uh, Ms. Spellings is the president and CEO of Margaret Spellings and Company. She is also a uh, renowned expert on domestic policy. But of course, she's most famous for serving as the Secretary of Education from 2005 to 2009, during which time she oversaw the implementation of the No Child Left Behind Act. From 2001 to 2005, she was a White House domestic policy advisor, during which time she helped craft the No Child Left Behind Act and also oversaw the implementations of the President's Emergency AIDS Relief Package. Prior to coming to Washington, she served uh, then Governor George W. Bush, worked in the Texas legislature and represented Texas school boards. She serves as a senior advisor to many organizations across the country and on numerous boards. She's appeared on the Colbert Report, The Daily Show, Meet the Press, Celebrity Jeopardy, and tonight she appears in the John F. Kennedy <laughs> Jr. Forum. It's my privilege to introduce one of my favorite Texas Republicans, Margaret Spellings. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Well, as Mark said, it has been my great privilege and thrill to be a fellow here at the IOP this fall. And Senator Culver, uh, it has been a real treat. Thank you for your leadership of this program, and uh, thank you for your presence here tonight. Um, I also want to thank and welcome everyone here today. We have a, my favorite topic, education, uh, which is such a unifying theme. We're all experts. Uh, we've all been to school and have a lot to say about it. Uh, our topic tonight is called Strange Bedfellows, which is not just a sexy little title we came up with to get you here. It actually has the, the added value of being descriptive of the kind of politics we put together to enact education reform. And really, there's no better example of that, in my humble opinion, uh, than George Bush and Ted Kennedy working together on uh, No Child Left Behind. And I think it's very fitting and appropriate that we're having this discussion here tonight. Um, I, I'm, I really have uh, thought very fondly about Senator Kennedy as I've been here this fall, and, and certainly he's left such a huge legacy in education. So um, I'm thrilled to have with us uh, the, some of the top leaders in education reform in our country. And I know this will date me, but it's like we have Mick Jagger, Bruce Springsteen, and Tina Turner all together <laughs> on the same stage tonight. If this, were, if this were a rock and roll uh, topic, that's who we'd have. Maybe more currently, it's uh, Lady Gaga, Jay-Z, and Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at, Governor? I'm not Justin. <laughs> I'd rather be Mick Jagger. I bet. Uh, so seriously, uh, our guests are fantastic, and, and I'll first introduce uh, my friend and someone that, that uh, I've known for a good while, Jeb Bush, who was the governor of Florida from 1999 until 2007, uh, made a huge difference uh, in education in this country, was a real pace setter, uh, and somebody we, we miss in that role. Uh, he made accountability and data and choice really the centerpieces of it, school reform in Florida, and uh, now has started a nonprofit called the Foundation for Excellence in Education, which is a major uh, provocateur of education debates. He has his own consulting firm, Jeb Bush and Associates, and uh, gets around a lot these days. Jeb, thank you for being here. Uh, next, Chancellor Ree, Michelle Ree. Uh, the former chancellor of the Washington, D.C. public schools, the barely former, uh, serving from 2007 just to October. She began her career at Teach for America uh, as a teacher, teacher in Baltimore and then began the new teacher project. And Michelle, that's where we knew each other for the first time, uh, where you were there in 1997. She's also an alumna of this fine institution, as well as having attended uh, and has a degree from Cornell. Finally in the strange bedfellows uh, mode, uh, the president, John Podesta, the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress, an important action tank, not just a think tank, but a do tank in Washington, D.C. He served at the highest levels of government, including as President Clinton's chief of staff. He was the co-chair of President Obama's transition team. He uh, got his uh, start with uh, 
Senator Culver on Capitol Hill and uh, is a graduate of Knox College and Georgetown University Law Center. So thank you all for being here today. Um, as I said, our topic tonight is, is about how we build the right kind of political climate and an opportunity to make the changes in our schools. And I'd like to, to begin exploring that topic on what it takes to advance education reform. So, so Governor, uh, you've had a lot of practice in doing this in a big state, in a diverse state. Uh, talk about uh, how it is that you as an elected official can make the politics of education reform work. Thank you, Margaret. It's a blast being with you. And uh, it has been a real joy for me for the last week to be a fellow at the Institute of Politics. I thought when I came here, it would be like being uh, Republicanus extinctus, and people would come, <laughs> like, point at me and feel, see if, uh, in fact, the Republican was still alive and breathing. Uh, but in fact, uh, I've been treated with incredible respect, and I'm completely energized by being with so many um, um, unbelievable students. So, it's been a joy to be with you all. When I was governor, I had one advantage. I made education kind of the chief political issue before I made it the chief policy issue. And that, I think, is a, a good lesson going forward for all aspiring public servants is to, if you have a passion for something, you shouldn't like keep it a secret. You ought to let people know before you uh, be, get into a position of responsibility exactly or at least the broad guidelines of what you want to do and be, be, be big, be bold, fill the space, make the whole debate about your idea because then it gives you a mandate, um, at least people perceive it to be a mandate, to go do what you said you were gonna do. And so in 1998, that's what I did. And we graded schools A, B, C, D, and F, 100% based on student learning, half how kids did to the standards, half how they did to learning gains. We built the best of class data bank for uh, measuring how we were doing to allow us to adjust. Um, we, we rewarded schools that did better. We created vouchers for schools that were failing more than two years, and it created a, particularly in the lowest performing students, it created a real burst of energy and, and a dramatic increase in, um, in, uh, in improvement. So Florida's gone from literally the bottom of the pack in graduation rates. We've gained, our graduation rate has gone up every year in the last 12 years to the point we were at 60% graduation rate, which is horrible, to almost 80% it was announced today incrementally over time, which is pretty good. Still not as good as I'd like to see it. And fourth grade reading based on the NAEP scores, 29th out of 31, 1998, 10 years later, sixth out of 50. So I guess the point is, if you say what you're gonna do, you stick with it, you just you know put tire marks on your forehead because it's not easy and take on the critics and try to draw people towards it and find creative ways to add value along the way, we can move the needle in public education. And I wish I was governor today with, this, with the possibility of more bipartisanship in that regard, because it would accelerate the learning dramatically. And I'm actually very optimistic today in America that there is a growing consensus that we need to move to a customized learning environment, and it ought to be child-centered, and all the adults ought to get out of the way and focus on them. That's a, a medium speed pitch over the plate for you, John. I mean, how did uh, President Obama create the conditions where people like Jeb Bush and Margaret Spellings are optimistic about <laughs> <laughs> moving forward politically on education reform? Well, I think, you know, I think that both during the course of the campaign and then uh, in, in building his team, uh, he's made this a priority. He's brought it uh, both as a priority into the White House. Uh, the first decision he had to make, of course, uh, was who to appoint to lead the effort for him. Uh, and he got a great reformer from the city of Chicago, Arnie Duncan, uh, who uh, pushes people, I think, outside of their comfort zone, both uh, uh, from a policy perspective and, and, and politically. Uh, and he gave him a lot of backing and backup uh, right from the, the, right the get-go. And I was around, you mentioned that I was there in the transition and, and working uh, with, I didn't know Arnie before that. I got to meet him during the course of the transition. Uh, but I think he gave him a lot of backup in terms of the people he wanted to bring into the department, uh, which is a kind of full roster uh, of reformers to, uh, from K through 12 up through higher education. Uh, and then I think he made it a priority uh, really even from the uh, very earliest days of his administration. I think that uh, uh, he saw the ability to link 
uh, additional funding to the need for reform. So the Recovery Act, which pr probably the governor and I may disagree with, it was a good idea to pass the Recovery Act, but the education portions of the Recovery Act, there was $49 billion uh, in that bill that passed, I think, t t uh, 21 days after the president was inaugurated, uh, contained, it not only contained money, I think it contained the, the uh, undergirding for what would be a long reform effort. More emphasis on building out data systems so that you could actually track uh, improvement from uh, all the way back from uh, not just with respect to uh, the uh, students and the ability of teachers to move student performance, but moving all the way back into teacher preparation, et cetera. Uh, put a lot of emphasis in trying to change where the real action is, which is in the states and in the, in the districts through what, is, what they, uh, ha was dubbed the Race to the Top Fund, which s the Secretary has uh, tried to implement. That created a wave, I think, of a political wave for, for reform so that uh, 10 states, I believe, changed their uh, education, their basic education law to per permit more charters to do the kinds of things that were uh, contemplated by the Race to the Top Fund. Ten states changed the law before they even announced that they were open for business uh, in terms of taking applications. I think uh, since uh, that happened, 28 states have fundamentally changed their, uh, their approach to uh, reform, putting more emphasis uh, on uh, teacher effectiveness, teacher improvement, being able to understand what was going on inside uh, the schools and, and, and districts. Uh, 12 states have now gotten uh, funds, or 11 states in the district, or 12 states in the district, uh, have gotten uh, funds under, uh, under that race to the top fund. It's, it's in the early days of implementation. He also put an emphasis on innovation, uh, and again, uh, through uh, authorities in that or, or original bill that passed at, in, in his early days, uh, has been able to support not just school systems, but NGOs who are doing important work to try to create innovative models and test them. So I think that he's uh, tried to uh, not just put the money out there, but put his, uh, put his voice, uh, put the emphasis on uh, results, put uh, his emphasis on making this not just about teachers, but really about student performance and how we move the country forward because you know, we didn't start here, we didn't, we didn't start in this conversation on this, but the country can't succeed unless this effort succeeds. Uh, unless we uh, do a better job of, of training and educating our students, uh, which, have, which we could go through the statistics about how we're falling behind competitively internationally, but unless we, unless we fundamentally succeed uh, at that effort, then the economy won't succeed and the country won't succeed. So let's uh, fast forward into the real world where Michelle has been in the trenches working on these things and uh, you know we, we policy wonks sit around and talk thoughty thoughts and then it gets <laughs> down to the real life of you know closing schools, dismissing teachers, you know sustaining public will or not. Michelle, why don't you talk about those, that decision making and, and where, I mean are you optimistic or pessimistic about where we are now with respect to how we make it happen on the ground after your experience? Uh, I have mixed emotions right <laughs> now. Uh, I feel, and on the one hand, that, the, that this is a, a particular moment in time where we could actually see an incredible sort of sea change or transformation, given that uh, the issues of public education and the reform efforts have sort of seeped into the general consciousness of America in, in a more significant way through the Waiting for Superman movie, you know, you, NBC did this Education Nation Week. Uh, so I think it's, it's hitting the general public in a different way. Um, but at the same time, I think that um, if you look at sort of the education reform community, there's lots of different uh, ideas about how we move forward with reform and um, certainly the, uh, the election that um, resulted in my boss uh, not being in office anymore also give, gave people a tremendous amount of pause. So I think we're sort of at this point right now where we, where we can either move forward aggressively and crack the whole thing open or be looking at another 10 years of not really doing a whole lot of anything. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that we, we, we go with, with the first. 
So, so let's talk about what it takes to set the table politically, whether it's at the state level or, or in Washington specifically. Um, you know, what, what, do you th what will it take for parents to you know, stay the course on the really tough work, the tough decisions that have to be made? Michelle? I, I think this is probably something that we, we did not figure out in, in D.C., right? So when I came into office, our, our idea was, okay, if we just put our heads down and we work hard and we, and we see big results, then people will be happy with that and they'll want it to continue. And I, I could not have been more wrong about that calculus uh, because, you know, we took, we, we managed in a three-year time period. In fact, in the first two years of being in office, we went from being the, the lowest performing uh, jurisdiction on the NAEP examination, which is a national, national gold standard test, to leading the nation in gains in both reading and math, both fourth and eighth grade. We were the only jurisdiction in the country <coughs> in which every single subgroup of children improved their uh, academic standing. Um, you know, so we saw outsized gains for that period of time academically, but it didn't result in people saying, okay, we want more of this, let's keep going. Um, and so, uh, you know, though Mayor Fenty and I certainly didn't figure out the whole political dynamic, what I hope that we did um, was sort of successfully chart a, a, show people sort of a new, a new route, right? So uh, when we started, what we knew was that we didn't want to just go down the same route that people had gone down uh, for decades and think somehow that we were cuter, smarter, and faster, and so we were going to do it better, right? We said, we're going to take a completely different path. And between the two of us, we thought, okay, playing to our strengths, our path is going to be, as he always said, go 100 miles an hour, Right, just uncompromising. Um, you know, just go as fast as we can, as aggressive as we can. And um, I think that through this experience, you you are able to see what can be accomplished in terms of academic gains in that short period of time. And certainly, we made a whole lot of mistakes along the way. And so, hopefully, what we've done is created uh, a, a different dynamic so that people now can say, okay, if we want to build on the good things that, that they did in DC and we want to avoid the same pitfalls, then here's how that can be done. So I think hopefully we change the conversation a little. So Governor, I mean, it gets down to, are we about adults and the interests of adults and things that are good for adults and are, or are we about things that are good for kids? Right. How do you keep that parent versus Versus it's, it's really hard. I mean, I, we had the same experience and we would, you know, we had these high stake tests that measured whether schools were great, how they were graded. Um, it was a traumatic time for everybody, particularly people who had invested all their political capital in, the, uh, in, this, uh, in this effort. And so uh, we had to build over time a constituency of support that is still not as strong as it should be or needs to be. Uh, and so I, I, what I found was I think you have to do almost two times or five times more than you think you have to. You have to like, because people watch all this with their peripheral vision. So we'd have these big, huge press conferences shamelessly promoting what were good results, kind of continuous improvement, and it was ho-hum. And you know, the press was doing its job to point out where it wasn't quite as great as I was bragging it was great, and, and so it, there was a mixed message, and we had to learn how to consistently hit it. And we just had to consistently make the point over and over and over again. And the, the last lesson I would say, and the lesson we didn't uh, implement that's beginning to be implemented around the country is you need to create a political constituency around the children's right. success. And um, that, requires fun, it, that requires a political campaign. So in Florida, our choice programs are protected by an aggressive effort to support candidates that believe in school choice, public and private, to the point where after three election cycles, African-American legislators in Florida support the corporate tax scholarship program in their majority. There's an eight or 6,000 person march on Tallahassee to every year to put a face on this. And the face, by the way, is 95% African-American and Hispanic children with their moms and their teachers and the pastors of the schools that the children go to. And so a constituency has built up there. The next constituency we need to build is on how to reward teacher effectiveness because 
the union is very powerful. I mean, they play politics. They don't, this is not a policy issue for the teachers union. Their, their, their power is in the political arena, and it has to be matched with people power on the other side, led by parents. And so in places I know of, you know, Florida's going to be one of those. Other places have been, Colorado's a place where, uh, but for that, that political action, the teacher compensation bill that passed, which was a great bill by a Democratic governor and a Democratic state senator, uh, Senator Johnson, that would not have happened without that outside support. So that was kind of a lesson learned a little too late for me. Exactly. So one of the things when we were working on No Child Left Behind, you know, I knew what, what we had to have and what we could have, what the, what the more difficult political issues were and what the things we could get consensus uh, on. Let's talk about some of those. Where do you think the contours are? Uh, and Jeb, you know, the, the political, the politics on our side of the aisle has changed since 2000. You know, we had, you know, President Bush was able to bring more Republicans to the party on this issue. Uh, the Tea Party, uh, they're more back to the abolish the Department of Education type thing. You know, let's all, I, I want to hear your views on where, what, what are the contours and, and uh, you know, conflict areas around education reform going forward, specific policy issues. Can I jump in on this other conversation? Please do. <laughs> I'm a resident of the district. My kids went to D.C. public schools. My wife's on the, uh, on the uh, restructuring committee at our local junior high school. Uh, and I think that places are different, and we need to recognize that. And the politics in one place are going to be different than in other places. Uh, it, in my, uh, you know, what I think happened in the district, I, I, I heard uh, Michelle say that you thought if you just did a really good job, the politics would follow. I was thinking to myself when you said that, that's, that's kind of what President Obama was thinking up to the midterm election. Um, and uh, the, 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 the kind of political context, I think, has to be taken into consideration. And it seems to me that, uh, I, the, what Governor Bush said is fundamentally right. You have to build a political constituency uh, as you move forward uh, to keep this momentum, uh, to keep the forward momentum sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that's a challenge to all of us. It'll be different, I think, in different places. If, uh, uh, the governor mentioned Colorado. That's a place, I think, where under Michael Bennett's leadership in the, in the city of Denver and then uh, the, the statewide leadership, there was an ability, I think, to fight with the unions, but also ultimately to bring them along. Uh, other places are going to be different. Uh, uh, Chancellor Reeve faced just such a different uh, situation with, a, with a, a really both a broken system and, a, and, and, a, and at that point a broken union that was in receivership by the national union by then. Uh, and so I think we ha the, the common element has to be to try to build uh, support on the ground, not just amongst parents, but a, but a broad section, including the business community, uh, for education reform. And I think that if you look at the Congress going forward, there's, and you listen to both sides, what they've said really even subsequent to the election, I think that, that uh, the president has focused on this as an area where he can try to find some bipartisan compromise, uh, as uh, President Bush and Senator Kennedy, Congressman Miller were able to do completely at the opposite extremes of of their uh, of their politics, but they were and able Bader. to. And Bader. And Bader, right, yeah, yeah. right. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I think that that gives some hopeful sign. But what's happened, I think, is that the the kind of mil middle's been a little bit hollowed out in, in this Congress. And so I think we don't really know. Mm -hmm. If I had to say where they're still going forward on a policy level, still strong, probably majority support, it's going to be uh, for the kinds of uh, efforts to, to build in the systems that where one can actually create accountability. There's going to be a need to be an adjustment, I think. Uh, in terms of No Child Left Behind, in terms of how that actually gets done, and there's some ideas out there that probably have some bipartisan support. Uh, but it's going to be combined, I think, with more focus on, uh, on this question of teacher effectiveness, which was, uh, in some ways, I think, when, uh, Margaret, when you were 
fighting through Title II of uh, ESEA and No Child Left Behind was less of a topic, but I think that's a place where both Democrats and Republicans have focused on this issue about how we uh, create incentives to, to make sure that we recruit, retain uh, effective teachers and we can dismiss and get rid of uh, teachers that are non-performing. Uh, I think there's, there could be uh, some common ground there. Uh, it'll take, I think, both sides getting a little bit out of their comfort zone and having a real dialogue, but it won't happen uh, uh, without that kind of broad-based political support coming from the grassroots and pushing uh, the system towards uh, continuation, I think, of, of really good efforts that have gone on now through uh, both Democratic and Republican presidents, Democratic and Republican governors across the country. Michelle, do you think teachers and teacher effectiveness is the unifying political uh, argument we make to the public, or is it something else? Well, I think there is a, a difference between is it the unifying um, uh, sort of point that we make with the public versus the sort of politicians, and the politicians are the ones that that create the laws and the policy, and I'm a little bit more worried about doing it with the politicians than I am with the general public. Um, and, you know, if you look right now at, at why the teachers unions have been so effective, um, and they have effectively driven the educational agenda in this country for the last few decades, it's because they have millions of dollars and millions of people, and they use those dollars and those people to get the politicians that they want elected, and the laws that they want passed, and the laws that they don't want blocked. And it's pretty clear. <laughs> and meanwhile, you know, and, and let me be clear that, that um, I, I, I don't begrudge the teachers' unions anything. Everyone says I'm anti-union. I'm not actually anti-union at all. Um, I think the unions are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Their job is not to uh, ensure that public education in America is great. Their job is to protect their members, their jobs, maximize their salaries and their pay and their privileges. And they are doing an excellent job of that. <laughs> the, the, the problem is that there is no organized interest group in this country that defends and promotes what is right for kids. So if you have this lopsided system where the, the, you've got a really effective lobbying group on one side, but you don't have an organized mechanism on the other side, that's when you end up with a system that sort of you know, spews out these, these skewed policies. So. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the biggest challenges that we face, and if we're trying to sort of do this in the political realm, I think we've got a lot of trouble ahead of us because, you know, as, as do-gooder reformers, we go to politicians and we try to appeal to their sense of what is good and right for children. And meanwhile, the unions are, are, are funding their campaigns. So where are you, you going to go? With the do-gooder or with the person who's going to get you reelected? Right? So that's why I feel like... Um, if we just rely on the politicians for this, we're, we're in trouble. Uh, we really do, it, it does have to be about normal people getting in the mix on this and uh, us not as a nation falling into the obvious traps of, uh, well, if we're going to sort of question some of the um, provisions uh, in teachers' union contracts, all of a sudden that means you're anti-union and anti-teacher. No, that doesn't actually have to be the case. We have to be able to break that up a little bit in order to move forward. Governor, is it possible to separate teachers from labor organizations? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I mean, I, I think part of the solution is, I mean, you fight them. That's what you do. You don't play footsies with them. You, you fight the union to support the teachers. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 my, that's Jeb's way. Jeb's way is not the only way, but it's the only way I knew how to do it. <laughs> and it worked. And it's sustainable because we fought and fought and fought and fought and we didn't stop. And they kept fighting back. I mean, it was a good, fun fight. And we won most of the time. And so uh, Florida's ahead of the game on a lot of things because that was the case. But I think what's missing right now, and it's maybe for both the political class as well as the public, is to figure out a way to make this not a federal priority or a government priority, but a national priority. because. This is, um, there are some things that just won't continue if we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And a third of our young people graduating from high school, college, and career ready is not sustainable for a great country. We'll be a less great country if we keep this up. So 
the president, um, I think, has a huge role to play if he takes it, and this is, this is his strong suit, to com compel, unite people behind the fact that this is a national priority. He doesn't have to have necessarily, it, it's not money that drives this. I mean, how much do the students per student funding in Washington, D.C.? About $9,000. I mean, that's a pretty good size sum. We spend more per student in, in, the, in the world, uh, in the United States. The answer isn't always money. It's, it's that there needs to be a compelling story, correct one in my mind, that this is a national priority. And I think if you do that, you have moms and dads realizing that they have to be part of this. All of the school districts, thousands and thousands of school board members, and it's not just teachers unions that are resisting to change, it's this thousands of these adults in the system that are they're worried about change because it may hurt their pensions or it may hurt their salaries. Uh, business leaders are not as engaged as they need to be. Mm -hmm. There's a whole, universities should be concerned about the quality of graduates going into their universities because it's not fun to do remedial coursework in a community college or most of, I mean, Harvard doesn't have this, but trust me, there are a lot of universities that spend enormous amount of resources redoing what wasn't done right in high school. So. You know, I'm not, this was a place we tried. I'm not sure I was completely successful. I was better at the fighting part, not the here's the lush green valley on the other side <laughs> of this rocky hill. But that, there needs to be some eloquent uh, communication to the American people about how we've got to get this right. And frankly, the, the other element I'd say that's unique about this, this is about the only major policy place where Republicans and Democrats could actually get together which brings to the last point I'd say is, we've got to find one place at least where we, we find common ground because it may actually be contagious, story. John. I mean, maybe, maybe <laughs> another thing happens after that and another after that, I don't know. But at least one, let's I, find one. I think the, the governor is right that, that um, it actually has to be sort of a change in mindset nationally about what we're doing. And, and if I had to break it down into one concept, it is competition. We have to regain America's competitive spirit because we have completely lost it. And I'm talking about at every single level. So if you look right now at our children, right, we want to say, we want to build self-esteem in kids and you are, you are, you're a winner, you're good, you're great. You know what? They're actually not great at everything. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you an example. I have, I have two children, an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old. They play soccer. They suck. <laughs> no, they do. They, they take after me. They are not good. But if you were to see the trophies and the medals and the ribbons lined up in their room, you would believe that I was raising the next Mia Hamm. And, and, and so we, we want to make all kids feel good, but we don't actually do them any favors by telling them they're good at something when they're really not good. The lesson needs to be, you know what? You lost this time because you didn't do so well. You got to work hard. You got to practice more to be the best. And it doesn't just come, it. <laughs> right? So we have to do it at, at, at the kid level. We have to do it, I mean, look at the next level up, which is teachers. We don't want to differentiate amongst teachers. We want to tell all teachers that they're, that they're good. But not all teachers are good. And, and it's OK, it, because the only way that we're going to be able to recognize and reward the great ones and, and create a really you know, true profession is if we begin to differentiate. But we don't want to do that, right? Um, I mean, look, when I inherited the district, 8% of our kids were on grade level in mathematics, uh, but 95% of the adults were being rated as doing an excellent job. Uh, how can you have that kind of a disconnect, right? We have to be able to say you're not so good at that, and for people not to take it personally. Okay, I said this <laughs> yesterday. It's, it's like um, now if you tell a teacher you're not doing a good job, it's like you're, 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 you're you know, attacking the whole profession. No. It's like it, I said yesterday, if I all of a sudden decided I want to become a professional basketball player and I you know, went out for the team, I would hope that somebody would say to me, you, you stink at this. You should not do it. And if I was to say, but, but I went to practice every day and I threw 100 free throws and I did everything that I was supposed to do, it doesn't matter because you're not helping the team win. So you need to go find a different profession, <laughs> Michelle. And it's nothing personal, it's nothing personal about you. You're not a bad person. We're not blaming all basketball players. We're just saying you need to go find something else to do. We need to depersonalize it a little bit and make it okay to compete. 
And even at the, at the national level, right? I mean, we, we have to understand that the only way that America is going to become number one again is to fix the public education system. If you look at countries that are doing extraordinarily well right now, like Singapore, which makes me rethink uh, benevolent dictatorships uh, completely. <laughs> but the, you know, if you look at their economic plan, education is at the center of their economic plan. In America, ec uh, education is a social issue. So what happens to social issues and tough economic things, they get brushed to the side and they get cut and all this sort of stuff. We need to make education an economic issue and the driver to make America number one. So John, you're uh, closer to President Obama than anybody on this panel. Um, so he's a wartime president with a serious economic issues. I know for sure that to pass No Child Left Behind, the president has, or, or any kind of serious education reform, the president has to spend a lot of time talking about it and a lot of time working with members of Congress on it. I mean, is President Obama likely to do that? What will it take for him to serve as educator in chief around this creation well, of a sense of urgency? You know, I think I think he's. He's, he actually has gone out. It's one of the th key things that I think he's tried to uh, talk to the American public about. But I think really the, question, the, the serious answer to your question is whether Governor Bush is right or not. Is this going to be a place where they can get some traction and real cooperation to move something forward? Um, well, we'll you raised, the, you raised the, the principal um, the chairman of the committee, mm -hmm. when No Child Left Behind was passed, is now going to be the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. It is a place I think they can come together and try to move something forward. If this is, if the next year is a is a, a year of unbridled partisanship where nothing gets done and and just points are scored, then I think that his capacity to keep, you know, Artie Duncan out there fighting for it is going to be there, I think, because he believes in it and he right. cares about it. And I think he thinks that, uh, you know, as I said and, and as the Chancellor said, it's critical to the future success of the country. So I think he'll, he'll, he'll be out there uh, dealing with it, but whether it has political traction, I think, is going to be, def is going to be defined, really, by whether there can be a space that Republicans and Democrats can sit around the table and decide it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, it's a it's a win-win situation for both of us. And I don't know I don't know what, that we know the answer to that yeah, yet. We don't. You know, um, my experience is, and I used to say this that you know, reform plus resources equals results. I, I dare say, Jeb, you never passed an education reform plan without putting some money in. I mean, I think most governors do, and that has been our formulation. Certainly, race to the top was that. Now we don't have any resources. You know, what, what, what's, how do we Although factor? Race to the Top, I mean, it, it is worth pointing out. Race to the Top was $10 billion, but it's, that's small, you know? Some people uh, think that's a lot of money, right? No, <laughs> not, not when you More compare it to the money. amount of money we're spending in public yeah. education in the country, and it produced tremendous change. So if you use those dollars, or even if you use the, what are likely to be restraint, maybe budget cuts, both uh, clearly, that's going to happen, and I think in, in, in it's already been happening in the states. But I, I think if the you use them uh, in a smart way, uh, as opposed to uh, if you you know you sort of you, if you do the wrong things when you reduce the funding, as yeah. opposed to the right things, you're going to have a different result. Michelle, take, speak I, to I the think the resources. budget cuts actually. I mean, nobody likes budget cuts, but they could be used as an opportunity in many ways. So, for example, um, huge budget cuts in education in the school district means layoffs of teachers. And the way that uh, teachers get laid off in this country is LIFO, right? Last in, first out, which is insane. It makes absolutely no sense as a policy for children to, to arbitrarily say if you were last hired, you are the first out, because research shows that there actually isn't sort of this direct correlation between how long you've been in the classroom and how effective you are. And so it is an opportunity, I think, for parents who have their children in the classrooms of brand new teachers and who think they're doing a fabulous job to say, wait a second, I'm, not gonna, I don't, I'm unwilling to lose my great new teacher just because this is what the common practice is. So it, it's an opportunity, I think, to push uh, some significant changes in these sort of age-old dinosaurish type policies um, 
uh, now that you're, you're, you're looking at having to, to, to lay a whole lot of people off, like, let's use that as an opportunity to actually push for changes that are long, long overdue. Governor, I want you to speak to this uh, resource issue and the role that it plays in, in pushing forward reform, and then we're going to open the floor to, to questions. Well, I always, I always found uh, money to be lubrication, if you will, for reform. <laughs> it was like, uh, it, it ne never necessarily was a big number, but if you were advancing something that was, it, to use a Bush analogy, it would be like forcing people to eat broccoli. <laughs> but then giving them like melted cheese and hot sauce to put on it to make it go down. So the money made it possible to take away some of the harder edge nature of the reforms we were doing. But those are on the margins. We, we basically had a strategy that you fund the things you want, the, the things you really care about first. And if there's more, and there was during the time I was governor, so we, we made education a priority in general, but we funded the priorities of the reforms first and, and we protected them. And it became kind of interesting because everybody knew it was like my first priority, so it was the way the legislature would negotiate with me as they would threaten to take away the school recognition money, for example, which was how we rewarded schools that showed improvement. But, I mean, I, I was clearly transparent about that, and that was the price I paid, but it, it helped keep the reforms on track. If, we, if you want to increase AP classes for underserved areas, which Florida has been one of the leaders in the country, and you've got to pay for yeah. it, you can't. So those are the things that we did, uh, but I don't think money, I mean, actually, I think money sometimes makes us lethargic. Um, if it's just kind of going at a regular pace, you don't, you don't really, are, you're not forced to challenge how things are done. I, I would imagine at Harvard when there was a downturn in the stock market and the endowment got hit, that it may have created a, a sense, of, oh my gosh, we've got to figure out a better way, a new way of doing things, and great institutions like this one probably did it far better than the ones that didn't have that sense of urgency that, that required them to change. And so schools, schools can survive with, with, um, with downturns in budget. The world's not going to come to an end. We still do spend more per student uh, than any country in the world uh, in any measurement that we have. So um, we're about to open the floor to questions, but uh, I'm going to give an excused absence to Chancellor Ree, who's going to have to sneak off. So let's quickly give her a Thank round you. of applause for her presentation. So uh, first, the ground rules. As many of you know, there are four microphones in the room. You can see them, two there and two on the floor. Uh, the ground rules around here for questioning are please identify yourself before asking your question. Uh, one brief question per person and a new and innovative idea. Your question must end in a question mark. <laughs> so uh, let's get started and to my left. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm from Michigan. And um, I, I grew up and uh, in Detroit, in Bloomfield Hills. There's some fantastic, very privileged socioeconomic schools, high, high, high privilege. And then, literally miles away, there are some of the most poorest, uh, dilapidated schools with very little opportunities. Is there any chance for reform within a state so that there's not massive economic imbalances within a state, so that literally four miles away, five miles away, there's not these huge discrepancies? Governor, why don't you Absolutely. Um, many states have uh, equalized funding. Some states have partial equalized funding. I think the funding ought to be completely equalized, and there also ought to be total transparency. So to Michelle's point about LIFO, for example, um, which is so true and so tragic, it also applies to how much resources go to a school. Many districts end up with a system where the teacher component of the budget is taken out of the discretion of the principal and is part of the collective bargaining process. So if Bloomfield would not be a good example because it's a separate district than Detroit, but inside of a large school district, like in Miami, you have very affluent areas where the disproportionate number of teachers are 20-year-plus teachers that are making $20,000 more per teacher than the central high school, which is predominantly African-American in a high-poverty area. And that tragedy plays out with a whole lot of, without a whole lot of dis discussion. So my solution would be, a common sense solution would be, give the principal the full budget. Let them hire the teachers that they believe are the best ones, but they don't, they don't pick and choose based on longevity of service. They have a fixed budget. And so you're going to have to have newer teachers. You're going to have to have older teachers. 
And I think that would bring greater equality of funding. And then you've got the Title I monies that, um, I mean, interestingly, in Florida, we know we can, we grade schools, A, th A through F, and we know how much money per student is spent in each school, and it's the inverse of what people would think. I know it's totally strange, but F schools spend, you spend about $1,500 more per student than A schools mm -hmm. because of the Title I money, and so it goes F, D, C, B, and A in terms of funding, but, um, but in a lot of places that's not the case, and so yeah. I think equalized funding matters. Yeah, I think the equalized funding has to go with the student, though, too, uh, and not, not just with the district or with the school. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and I think one of the things that's, uh, like most things in America, the system right now is upside down. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the kids that need the most help get the least at some level. Yeah. Uh, particularly in ter terms of assignment of teachers uh, in most districts where, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that the chancellor left, there was just a recent report out of the district where uh, when, now that she's put in a more uh, uh, soup to nuts evaluation system uh, and they looked at the evaluations amongst the teachers, where were all the best teachers? In the most affluent school, neighborhoods, in the most affluent schools. And where were the uh, newest, weakest teachers? In the, in the schools that needed the most. And I think that the federal law needs to be reformed in, with regard to this, including Title I, because well, you, as the governor noted, you Title I, one, This is our Title first one, reform that, that we can get President Obama and John uh -huh. Boehner to uh, support Title right here. Title I excludes, it, it uses an average teacher salary yeah. uh, formula. Yeah. So it excludes 80% of the, of the, uh, of, of the uh, kind of school, the, the actual school's budget uh, in trying to provide those benefits. We've got to put the incentives in put into putting the most effective teachers, in, and including pay, into the schools, I think, that need it the most. And I, 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 one thing I, I do agree with the governor on, the principal needs some control over that and, you know, and systems that permit uh, the, uh, and again, uh, the, the new contract in D.C. Yeah. sort of makes that a priority, giving more control of the school, for the school leader to be able to bring in better personnel. You heard it here first. Yes, sir, up there on the right, top right. Yeah. My, name, <clears throat> my name is Rafi Rosenblatt. I am a second year master in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, and one of the things that wasn't discussed a lot this evening was what happens for students after they graduate from high school. Um, and there's been somewhat of a shift in policy as far as um, whether or not all students should be attending four-year colleges, um, and specifically the Obama administration has really pushed for the expansion of community colleges. So I have a two-part question for both panelists. First, do you think all students should attend college? And second, um, how do we create real alternatives for those students for whom college is not on the immediate agenda? Jeff. Well, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. Age go before ahead. beauty. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree with All right, you this time. If it's, if, if it's age, then I have to go first. Um, no, we're, the, uh, uh, well, I think that, yes, I think he's uh, put an emphasis on community college because it's clear uh, that p people in the modern economy need post-high school uh, skills, uh, and community colleges are cost-effective ways to produce that, so they put a lot of emphasis in it, uh, and a lot of emphasis, I think, in aligning the skill needs of the community where jobs are going to be created w into the community college. Uh, we, we ought to apply the same rules of transparency and accountability in the higher education system that we're now <laughs> demanding in the K-12 system. And quite frankly, there's, there's very little uh, information available uh, to students to know uh, whether both the, the institutions they're attending and the certificates they're earning are actually have a high return on investment for, for the student or for their family. Uh, and I think one of the things that needs to happen, just as we've tried to push through data systems and, uh, and more transparency in the K through 12 world, that has to happen in the higher education world. And I think that's really a, a thrust of what, the, what these new initiatives that are being led by uh, by the president, and by the way, uh, Jill Biden, Dr. Jill Biden, 
uh, who actually teaches in a community college, did in Delaware, and now is teaching in a, in, in, uh, in a community college in Northern Virginia. Governor? Um, I think you know, the whole concept ought to be a focus on students graduating from high school, college, and career ready, mm -hmm. which requires high schools to be more focused on uh, helping students actually visualize what they want to do and make sure they have the skills, if that's the objective, to, to get it done. It may not require a two-year degree, an AA, AS degree. It may require uh, uh, some specialized kind of training. Uh, and so that's the second point I would make is that I think, I think we ought to blow up our job training programs and um, redesign them for the 21st century because job training today is basically it's close to, as close to an education uh, experience as it is to the traditional kind of, of, of training that ha these programs haven't changed for 50 years. Yeah. I mean, and it's a ton of money. It's a slug of money. And so to customize training and meld it together with this, um, I think, and then, and then, folk, and then make the, the case that this should be kind of a lifelong experience. Because yeah. jobs, if we're going to be competitive, we have to realize that jobs come and go. Whole categories of jobs that we don't know are going to be created in 10 years' time, which requires massive re-education and retraining. And I don't, I don't really necessarily see the difference anymore. And so um, I think this is a huge opportunity for uh, the Congress and the President to find another place where there could be common ground, which is to say, if we weren't doing what we're doing in this particular area and then looking at the long-term unemployed, that 35 and 45-year-old man or woman whose, uh, whose job, is, whose whole industry has been wiped out because of extraordinary competition, how would we do it? How, how would we do it? We wouldn't do it like the Wagner Act. No. I mean, come on. I mean, we wouldn't. These are embarrassing programs for 2010. They I are. mean, this, this, is, this, is, um, this is shameful. So, uh, this, the question is a great one. I think it needs to be expanded beyond just a 19-year-old to a 30-year-old that didn't, didn't finish high school that needs to get back on track, or a 45-year-old that's been unemployed now for, for 16 months. And you start playing out that mosaic of, the, of the, the challenge, and you begin to say, maybe we need lifelong learning as the objective, not just K-12, community college, higher ed, postgraduate, I mean, all these separate silos, maybe it should be viewed as a more a national priority again. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Matt Yari. I'm a freshman at the college. And my question is, over the past two years, this narrative has sort of started that charter schools um, with movies such as Waiting for Superman are the way for kids to get out of this, quote, failed public in, uh, education system. Um, yet some studies have shown that as a whole, they may not be so effective. So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on the charter school movement and if, at all, if it has at all detracted from the real focus of the education reform movement. I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think there's one thing that will change. Uh, I mean, ultimately, the only thing that matters is rising student achievement. Right. And, and we measure it. And if it's doing well, then it should be held up high and hopefully scaled and replicated and working. Uh, and if it's not working, we should stop doing it. So some charter schools work very well, some don't, some don't work at all. Uh, but that's only one element. I mean, we need to have, as John said, we need to have accountability on charter schools just as we do with traditional public schools. They are public schools. I mean, the idea that charter schools aren't public is just a, is a myth that's been created to stop their development and the freedom that, that they bring. These are independent public schools. So. Um, I think, I think by good data measurement, by holding schools accountable for student learning, you'll be able to separate the successes from the failures. And then if you have a system where you don't tolerate the failures or the mediocrity, uh, and you have a more dynamic uh, workplace, eventually the term charter is going to become irrelevant in my mind. I mean, all public schools eventually are going to get to this point where we're going to empower principals to make these decisions, and what we're going to hold them accountable to is our results. So I see a lot of violent agreement here. So well, they do, they do provide a basis for competition and innovation. And, voting and the people. best schools, the best charters, uh, you know, tend to be models, and they influence what's happening in the non-charter public environment. And I think that Massachusetts is a good example, where they've taken the experience of uh, uh, expanded learning time, which is 
probably a, a, one of the features of KIPP and some of the other mm -hmm. best charter systems and applied that now really on a statewide basis, at least exp experimentally, to try to reform the uh, school calendar, the way we uh, teach kids, particularly for, uh, for poor children who really need a, uh, a reorganized school calendar. That's been the success in some of the in some of the best schools. People have observed that. They brought it into the, you know, the, the non-charter public side, uh, and that competition and back and forth is really important. But what the governor said is ultimately got to be the bottom line. You've got to have transparency and accountability. And the charter schools that fail have to be treated just the way non-charter public schools that fail, and you got to get rid of them. Let's go up here on the upper left. Thanks very much. Oh, that's loud. Um, my name's Adam Gann. I'm a junior at the college. Um, the mic just turned off. Oh, no, the mic's <laughs> on. Sorry. <laughs> um, my question relates to the discussion earlier. The room seemed very supportive of Chancellor Rhee's uh, discussion of failing teachers in schools and removing bad teachers from classrooms. But as Mr. Podesta has said, we have an allocation problem when it comes to teachers, and we also have a shortage in general of teachers, not just great teachers, but teachers in general. So my question is, what sort of short-term and long-term improvements do you envision in terms of strengthening the entire teaching workforce, um, including but not limited to helping train struggling teachers rather than simply dismissing them? Well, I think there's some really uh, promising uh, programs where, with, with respect to uh, peer support for particular new teachers and struggling <coughs> teachers to improve using master teachers and mentor teachers to improve the performance of, of, of struggling teachers. But to the larger point of, uh, of how do we replenish, we're going to have a huge number of retirees now coming through the system in the next five years as baby boom teachers uh, are, are really beginning to retire. So we're going to have a, a lot of uh, replacement that has to go on, a lot of uh, hiring that needs to happen. How do we fill that pipeline? And how do we fill it with the best students? And I think that that's a challenge uh, that ultimately goes to this larger political argument we're making, which is it has to be cool to be a teacher. You know, we want the best people uh, to go into teaching. And I think you see the, uh, the success of, of something like Teach for America saying you could still draw very talented, very dedicated, uh, high-performing students into teaching, but the question is do you retain them? Do they stick with education? Mm -hmm. You know, sort of the jury's a little bit out on that. And how do you do that not as just, an, just as one strong NGO and one strong experiment, but how do you make it uh, how do you make it really a, a valued profession in our society? And part of that effort uh, that Michelle uh, talked about to say that it really is part of helping uh, America compete and succeed. I don't know. We should have a show of hands maybe in the room. How many of you are thinking about being teachers? <laughs> the guy asked the <laughs> yeah. question. Okay. Of course. A few. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John, it seems to me also, and we, we advocated this in the Bush administration, is we need an, kind of an adjunct teacher core. Just, we couldn't run higher education in America without the notion that subject matter experts can teach. If we think teachers can be subject matter experts, subject matter experts can, can teach, especially as baby, you know, why can't you teach in a classroom? Uh, I but do. you can't. Well, I mean, <laughs> I do, but it's in a law school. Well, exactly. So, I mean, why would you go you're back? Not, for but you're not qualified to teach you're in not, many high schools in of, the country because so. you're not certified. I mean, so part of the answer is to eliminate this bizarre certification process that is, you know, organized around 1900 Byzantine. and focused on an alternative certification program where you have people with huge knowledge and subject matter acting on their heart, or maybe. They're in mid-career. I've met a lot of, uh, what's the term here? The, the, the mid-career yeah. you know, degree programs. There's like half of you are in mid-career. Well, there's a reason why you're stopped. You're pausing because you're, you're reevaluating what you want to do or you have another thing to do. You, we, could, we could turn a lot of mid-career people on, but then, they, then they feel they, they, they're told what they have to do I to become a it. teacher, and it's all input-driven. It's all bizarre stuff. I mean, it's all... You have to take a course about the history of education in the 19th century. Like, that's really going to help you with an inner city kid in wherever you live. So 
Um, I say blow the whole thing up in terms of the certification process, bring in teachers that are, uh, have great competency in the subject matter, and then train them on how to, to control a yeah. classroom and to teach a, and inspire students, which can be done. And in fact, Harvard does that, believe it or not. And so there are other places that do it as well. Horace Mann's rolling over in his grave right now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Johannes Fresge from uh, the Business School. Um, my question is, uh, you guys have discussed on how education may be an issue where Republicans and Democrats can find common ground. What can we as concerned citizens do to make sure that uh, education reform isn't dead on arrival in the next few years? I mean, that's what we've been talking about is how to create a national constituency for reform. I think the focus is this huge dichotomy between the adults in the system, well-intended as they are, but their primary focus is their livelihood, their sustaining. They don't like the change. They don't want the, bo the, the boat rocked. Their economics at the expense of children, and I think the case has to be made that we don't have the luxury uh, to tolerate that anymore, that we need significantly better results. And, and that's the national priority that hopefully will draw more people towards us. I mean, you individually can make a difference by um, getting, letting, letting people know what your views are for the opinion leaders. I mean, I, I will try to make my difference as a Republican saying, all right, let's fight the big principle fight on size and scope of government, but in this one area, we've got to find some common ground to move forward because this is going to take a decade of time if we're successful. I mean, even if we're successful, it takes a decade of time. And imagine what the world looks like 10 years from now if we do nothing. You know, I th I th I'm just going to jump in here quickly. I also think we need some new soap. I mean, the, our discussions are the same old stuff we've been talking about for the last 20 years, accountability, data, et cetera. And I think not only do we need accountability, but we need to start talking about, especially in this resource-restricted environment, how well do we do at what price? I told earlier the story of being a Broad Prize judge, and uh, you know, Isleta and El Paso were two finalists, as was Montgomery County, Maryland. You know, three times five more spending going on in Montgomery County, and the fact that they're in the same cohort, who's the better school district? So we, uh, this new area of interest, which is how do we do for what investment? And that's uh, you know a way I think that we can bring Republicans, Tea Party Republicans potentially, Absolutely. Absolutely. into the discussion uh, where they wouldn't naturally be with well, us to today. The, to the point, there uh, Newark has spends twenty grand per student. Yeah. Average in Florida is like seven grand. If a reform takes place in Florida that that is successful, highly successful, that's scalable to the rest of the country. If a reform takes place in Newark that requires 20 grand per student and then 100 million dollars from the dude from Facebook, uh, you add all that up, <laughs> that's not scalable. I mean, no, no other place on the planet can do that. So the, to your point, we get to scalability if we get closer to what the average student um, funding is. And I'm all for the, don't get me wrong, uh, I forgot his name, but that Zuckerberg. is a spectacular Mark commitment Zuckerberg. to the city of Newark. And it's, there's a great mayor and hopefully with the governor's help, there's going to be low mayor, mayoral control, but whatever goes on there, it'll be hard for me to imagine that it'll be scalable. We're, we're going to uh, try, we are going to launch a website in January that takes district data and tries to create a return on investment metric Terrific. for Great. every district across the country. Thanks. Now, people bitch about that, and I'm sure we won't yes, have it exactly right, and we probably, <laughs> the data sets aren't uh, as good as they need to be, but I think that opens that conversation where you look at similar, and, and that's, I think, what competition does really just at the local level, which is you look at mm -hmm. the school with the A and the school with the F, and, and parents begin to say, how come my kid's in the school with the F and not the school with the A? Exactly. And I think we have to look at the, this idea. I think there'd be a lot of business support for that uh, to say that you know, we, need, we need better uh, performance uh, for every dollar that we spend. Um, so I think that I want to give one other example, though, on this on this question. Delaware, which was one of the was the first two states, one of the first two states to get uh, race, to uh, race to the top money. There was a very a sig significant effort to build a political movement on the ground in Delaware to support education reform before there was Obama, before there was race to the top, to try to push the state. Uh, from the grassroots up to, to adopt these reform ideas and proposals. And I think that really laid the groundwork for them having the best proposal 
uh, coming in the door and be the first recipient of, of the Race to the Top funds. That has to really happen uh, across the country in districts and in states so that what uh, that, 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 that this becomes something that political leaders can't turn away from. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Caroline McKay, and I'm a freshman at the college. I'm also a graduate of the Atlanta Public School System, which is a failing uh, school system. And um, uh, among other issues, there are allegations that are uh, substantiated by a lot of evidence that teachers and administrators have changed answers on standardized tests or called out answers. Uh, my question is whether um, schools should be rewarded monetarily by their performance, and if so, should their performance be judged or monitored by standardized tests? Uh, you bet. Being, being the Mr. <laughs> you know, accountability where the system has been in place the longest, absolutely yes, there should be rewards for improvement, and absolutely yes, there ought to be significant audit, auditing capacity and at the school level, and then the departments of education uh, need to have the ability, as they do, to audit and take it seriously. We had similar allegations that were found to be true. It wasn't an allegation, I guess it was. It's until a fact. It became a fact after <laughs> the audit from the DOE, and there's ways to, to, there's clear ways that you know where there is just abject cheating. Uh, and so, you know, the, the threat of a high stakes test is just that, that teachers feel, um, A, they feel bad for the kids, <laughs> B, they may feel bad for themselves that they haven't had the children gain a year's worth of knowledge in a year's time, and, the, and if they feel like there's no consequence or no one's watching occasionally, and I would say this is in the very small minority of cases, that will happen. But without accountability, without measuring, you're basically saying we don't care. You don't measure, you don't care in every aspect of life, every endeavor. And, uh, and, and not caring right now is tragic in this particular field because if you don't care, the achievement gaps grow. And so Delaware and Florida are the only two states in the last decade that have actually narrowed the achievement gap because data collection in both those states and some sense of measuring it is, uh, is, is, a, is a high priority. Well, no, I think that the, the, uh, the, this movement towards standards and assessment, which has been going on uh, from President Bush's days with uh, bipartisan governor support, just has, to, there has to continue to be momentum behind it. We can learn, uh, there, there's no, uh, what, uh, again, I just report on, on work we've done with the chamber that, 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 uh, that Margaret now uh, and, and we are partners on. We, t we looked at the 50 states and compared NAEP against the state performance tests. And that tells you a lot. Mm -hmm. Mississippi, <laughs> under the state performance tests, scored better than Massachusetts. On NAEP, Massachusetts was number one. So that tells you a lot. And you have to, you, that, that effort to, I think, really put data in front of, data, we, I, I agree with you. We gotta get better at using better words and make a, a more compelling story. If you tell parents what's really going on in their schools, they will demand change, I think. You know, the other thing I would say is that I, we're, we're getting more sophisticated about how we measure so it becomes more ubiquitous, more transparent to the, to the user, more ongoing. So this, you know, one day, you know, sitting in a room, teacher calling out the answers, I think those things are going to eventually evolve out of existence where technology will give us information over time and, you know, it'll be less susceptible to cheating. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I have two ma'ams. Okay. Oh, sorry. I, I brought this guy over here. You forgot. Okay. But, okay. So, um, hello. My name is Melissa. I'm a sophomore at the college. I attended Seminole High School in Sanford, Florida, which, as you know, is a region very much beset by structural violence. So my freshman class had 1,000 students, but we graduated only about 600. Somehow, though, we were still in a school. How did this happen? Magnet programs provided opportunities for students like me to get an excellent education, while the general population was ignored. How do we make sure that metrics hold schools accountable to their communities and not just test scores? Well, the way that uh, we did it is we changed the law to require that uh, you can't create separate schools, um, or you can't, there's a, two, two ways to game an accountability system. One is take, take the, um, to do, I mean this is not really gaming, but to bring, uh, bring students in for magnet programs, 
to make, to make the whole school look better. In the case of Florida, uh, Sanford High School, by the way, wasn't an A school for many years. I can promise you that because when I went to visit it, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a D school. And, and so maybe they made some adjustments to, to, to game the system. The second thing that happens is that mysteriously kids go to alternative schools uh, right before the test. And so we changed the rules there that anybody that went to an alternative school, which wasn't graded at the time, that they would be accountable in the existing grading system of the school. So look, I mean, if people are playing this game, they're not doing anybody any favors. Uh, but the net result is measured by the NAEP. So this is a test you can't teach to. Mm -hmm. some, some mysterious group of gnomes somewhere are <laughs> grading this test. No teacher knows how to teach to the NAEP. Florida is the state that has had the greatest gains in fourth grade and eighth grade reading over the last 10 years of any, any state. And it's because we have put a light on the fact that we've allowed kids to, to, to languish. We just, the, the graduation rate just came out in Florida. When I was governor first year, it was 60% of kids were graduating. Now it's 79.8%. Every year it's gone up. And it didn't go up by osmosis. It didn't go up because some Ouija board thing. It went up because we changed the rules and said, this matters, every kid matters. So, you know. I, I apologize to you if kids were, if the, if the principal and superintendent of, of uh, Seminole County played games in the system, but I guarantee you they'll get caught. I don't mean to insult my system. I'm sorry, I would take that back. <laughs> that wasn't what I was trying to say. We've, we've got time for two more questions. You uh, on my right and then up. At this the, guy's been waiting a long time, I know. He's going right now. <laughs> thank you very much, Governor. Uh, <laughs> and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Daniel Martinez, and I'm a sophomore in the college. And uh, my question is regarding uh, Governor Bush's optimism on bipartisanship. Now, obviously, the politics has changed a little bit. And as we know, on both sides of the aisle, there's a lot of political diversity. And what I'm wondering is, would you expect uh, agreement on education to be more of a wedge issue? Or do you think you can get more uh, people united? And this especially comes in light of the Tea Party movement on the right, because, and at the same time on the left, sometimes you have people who are very comfy with unions. You know, some people are, unfortunately, as Chancellor Reed pointed out, you know, it's just someone who's gonna keep things the way they like it. So, I mean, I'm just wondering what everyone would Great, like great question. I, I'll, I'll answer it real quick. I, I'm optimistic because the alternative is really depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. If we just say we can't do it, which is kind of where we are today, it can't, it can't happen, nothing can happen, in our own, I mean, the country has a cloud over it, and if we just cumulatively say we're on the wrong track, world's coming to an end, we're in a, we're in decline, nothing we can do, we'll get what we think about. And I would rather be optimistic and try to engage to find common ground. I'm not Pollyannish about this in this particular area because I actually do think that this is not a wedge issue, and I don't know how you would use it as a wedge issue. There's so many good wedge issues you could use <laughs> beyond this one. <laughs> you know, this one is one that uh, I think, I mean, if you think, I, I can't find a, think of another policy area uh, where a win could happen where both sides would feel like they did the right thing. Maybe there are others. And John, you're yeah. much closer to this than me. But I, so it's partial just hopeful optimism, but it's also, I think, uh, the reality is that there's gonna be some pressure to find one thing at least. I mean, I think yeah, there is, right. this election wasn't just about a shift to the right, it was also a, a, you know, a pox on all your houses. I mean, this was a repudiation, if you take two or three election cycles, this is clearly a repudiation of the political class in Washington. You know, it's gonna take some political leadership too. As I said, you, people have to get out of their comfort zone. You know, if, if you go back to, uh, to uh, putting that legislation together, uh, I, I think you accurately described the political dilemma, which is the parties moving in the Congress in particular. It's, I don't think that's actually true in the public, but the people who get elected to Congress that's right. over Agreed. the last three cycles, especially after three wave cycles, yeah. the center's hollowed out. <laughs> and so the, the, the Congress has moved, I think, to the right and to the left. And so how do you do, how do you, find compromise in that construct and in that context. And I think it's going to take leadership. I think that, uh, you know, Ted Kennedy and George Miller were close to the unions. Uh, the President Bush probably didn't come into office thinking he was going to probably spend quite as much on education as he ended up spending because <laughs> they wanted that money spent. 
but they both got a little bit out of their comfort zone. They were able to find ways to work together uh, with, again, now the new Speaker of the House, John Boehner, uh, and they were able to put something together. It's going to take that same kind of dynamic, I think, and a willingness uh, to sit down uh, and probably to sit down, Margaret could tell us better than, than the two of us would know, sit down quietly and behind closed doors and see if they can work some of this stuff out. One other thing, Danielle, that's not, not considered a factor uh, in Washington but should be is that um, <coughs> day after election day, close to 80% of the American people have a new governor elect. She's never had, I mean, this is a completely different circumstance. And my experience is first, first day, you know, first year governors, just as Governor Bush did in Texas and many other governors, this is a huge, this is a place for them to play. This is a policy place. Many of them made it in, a big issue in their campaigns. J creating jobs and reforming education are probably the top two issues uh, for winning governor candidates, Democrat and Republican. And so their voice can be heard in a positive way as well to bring some unity of purpose on this. And, and this is why I think we need a little bit, some new soap, because yeah. no child left behind, love it or hate it, you've heard of it. You know, it's, it's, it's radioactive in some ways. And so we got, what are the unifying sort of themes, like financial, you know, student results, yes. At what price? So everybody, there's a little something for everybody. The Tea Party years and the conservatives, the fiscal whatever, they get a little piece of the action and we get closing the achievement gap. But we, we don't have the right you know, rhetoric at, at the moment. It's the same old charter schools, merit, pay, heck. We've gotten old on this stuff, John. Yep. <laughs> it's got to be, you know, it's got to be a civil rights issue again. Too. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Serena Zhang and I'm a sophomore at the college. I specifically want you to comment on Race to the Top. Because historically, partisanship has prevented large-scale national education reform. And I was wondering exactly how race to the top can sort of overcome this bipartisanship to enact change in our schools. Well, I think that, it, you know, the, the, the real question is, well, will there continue to be momentum behind it? It's so, it's, it's President Obama's signature program. Uh, he's asked for additional funds to expand the group of states that could apply for that money. Uh, and I think that what, needs, what we're going to need to see is results on the ground. I already, I think, mentioned that we saw a lot of change just by proposing the program. The notion that this money was set aside uh, in the form of competitive grants caused states to, to really move uh, to places probably no one anticipated or expected uh, across a, r a range of reform issues. So it set off a competition, if you will, amongst the states uh, to go further. And that happened in states with Democrats as governors, and it happened in states with Republicans as governors. And some of the states uh, that received the, uh, the initial grants, those 12 states that received the initial grants, were led by Republicans and some by Democrats. So I think that at, at this point, I think you have to judge it just in its short tenure as a success. The question is, can you keep the momentum behind that idea of innovation, competition, uh, and, keep, you know, and, and keep that story being told? That's going to depend, really, I think, on what happens at, in, in real terms in the states that receive that money. So here, here's a, uh, an interesting little sidebar to this. Florida ended up getting race to the top money, a big slug of those, like 700 million. We were ranked third, uh, and we had to modify our proposal to make it less provocative, less reform-oriented to get the money. Uh, other states that, that had a similar situation, like Indiana and Louisiana, or Louisiana ended up not getting the money, but all right. by all accounts, by in, independent folks watching this, Louisiana had an incredible proposal. Absolutely and they didn't get the money, and then Indiana said, we're not, going to we're not going to back down on the reforms that we think are important, that we're ahead of the game because they're, they're further along in this reform process than New York State or places like that that did make changes to get in line with the money. So it, it, I think it had a very positive effect on changing behavior for states that were way behind. It's not had that same effect for states that already are acting on their sense of, of of interest in reforming things. In fact, it, you know, states like Florida were, were somewhat penalized, so we had to modify it to bring it back down. 
And then finally, the most important thing about Race to the Top, um, apart from these good things, is will we'll come if, if it moves the needle on student achievement. Yeah, it's not all this other stuff that matters. I mean, what matters is, are kids learning? Exactly. And um, are they learning the things that they should be learning? And that will take a while. I mean, that's not something you're going to find out in the next uh, six months, right? And, and what are we going to learn from the experiment um, and the causality of the, of, the, of the policy? So was it teacher pay that moved the needle? Was it this or that? And so, you know, I think the jury is absolutely out. You're right, early signs are encouraging, but, uh, you know, show me the money, right? I think, though, as a, <clears throat> we're, we're, after all, at the Kennedy School, I think as a kind of a, po a, a, a outside of education, as a policy theory, I think this idea that you can use an incentive mm -hmm. to create change through competition amongst the states Absolutely. is an idea that is going to catch on. And you'll see it applied uh, not just that in the part. education field, but across a broad range of public policy uh, issues, uh, particularly where you, where you want to see change happen and, you, and you've got entrenched uh, sort of thinking, particularly in the states. I think the federal government is going to find this to be a very attractive model that can use relatively scarce dollars to move things along more rapidly. Yeah. Absolutely. Amen. And on that note of uh, strong agreement, we will conclude our panel. Thank you to Governor Bush and to John Podesta. Thank you, John. It's fun. Yeah, good.